Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Malini Chatterjee from One Med Place. Uh, One Med Place is the home of One Med Research, and we cover small biotech and medtech companies, uh, and One Med Radio. Um, today we are with uh, Tom Moore, the CEO of Advexis Pharmaceuticals, for uh, One Med Radio live interview, um, Advexis Pharmaceuticals has been in the news uh, uh, since last night because um, they reported the phase two uh, trial uh, results and interim analysis of their phase two trial, which was conducted in women with um, a recurrent cervical cancer. This trial was run in India, and I will allow uh, Tom Moore to talk more about the trial. But before we get in, let me just uh, familiarize you a little bit with um, Advexis. Advexis Pharmaceuticals, ticker ADXS on the bulletin board, market cap um, $43 million and picking up slowly uh, every day. Um, uh, the stock trades about 900,000 shares a day, and so it is easy to build up a position in this name if one is interested. Um, Advexis is one of the few um, um, continuing immunotherapy companies um, in, the, in, in the marketplace um, or in the research space to be particular. Um, Dendrion is an approved agent. We have BioVest that is working on lymphomas and we have Advexis that is working on, on uh, cervical cancer. And um, um, the, the, their story continues to get better every day. Their phase one results were released in 2010, and today we will see interim analysis from their phase two study. Um, uh, so without much more, um, without wasting much more time, let me call on Tom Moore. Uh, Tom, good morning to you. Good morning, Melanie. I'm happy to be here. I am happy to have you. Uh, Tom, so you will remember that uh, we started, uh, uh, um, we initiated on Advexis in uh, December 2011, and we are happy to have you today to talk about um, about your agent, ADXS HPV, and going forward for this call, we'll just call it the drug. Uh, and so if you can, before we start to dig into the um, Phase two results from today, uh, from last night. Can you just tell me very quickly how this agent works? Well, Melanie, we we are uh, an immunotherapy, which means we use the body's own immune system to attack cancer. Uh, the technology was developed by Yvonne Patterson at the University of Pennsylvania um, after her own brush with breast cancer, and the technology utilizes a live bacterium called Listeria, which has been rendered safe. Um, to turn on a uh, hardwired genetic response to that bacterium and use that to turn on the immune system. And then we re-engineer the bacterium to give instructions to the immune system to take all that energy and use it to attack the tumor. Uh, because of the way it's built, it's a platform technology. We can in insert uh, instructions in the form of fused proteins that the bacteria secretes to attack um, a wide variety of cancers, infectious diseases, and even allergies. But our first effort, is, the so-called drug, is against cancers caused by the human papilloma virus, of which cervical cancer is the most prominent. Got it. And um, so you were saying that this technology is plug and play. You can use it across multiple different uh, cancer indications if you just change the, the, uh, rec the recombinant cassette. Is that true? Yes. In fact, uh, we've already had our discussions with the FDA for both a prostate cancer construct and a breast cancer construct, which we both expect to have in human trials this year. Very good. And, um, and Tom, so as we now start discussing the phase two um, um, recurrent cervical cancer study uh, for which you released the interim analysis results. Um, we can call this study the India trial because it was run in India. Can you just uh, walk me carefully through the design of this study and also um, uh, how did you decide the dose? How did you decide the schedule? What information did you gain from your phase one study uh, to move forward with this design? 
Well, uh, first of all, the, the disease we're treating is cervical cancer, which has failed to respond to earlier chemotherapy and or radiotherapy. Um, the prognosis for women whose uh, cervical cancer doesn't respond to therapy is quite poor um, in the research done in the U.S. Uh, the best survival rate uh, behind uh, the early uh, attempts to treat this was only a 5% landmark survival at the end of 12 months and a median survival of about six months. Uh, and so we're focusing explicitly on these patients because we had a very successful experience in our phase one study where we were able to improve median survival in a small group of patients, 13, from uh, the expected uh, six months to just under a year and improve landmark survival at 12 months from five, the expected 5% to an actual uh, achievement of 54%. So we're going back to the same group of women. Um, we are instituting a couple of key changes based on the learning we had in phase one. In phase one, we only administered two doses of the immunotherapy spaced a month apart with no other therapy for these women. And so in this study, we're doing three doses spaced a month apart, so day zero, three, and day 60. And uh, we also took the population and randomized, randomized them into two treatment arms. One is the immunotherapy alone. The other is the immunotherapy, then a round of cisplatin, the most commonly used treatment for cancer, followed by uh, three more uh, uh, immunotherapy uh, IVs. Uh, and so uh, 110 patients are targeted for recruitment in this study. We currently have 88, and uh, the 110 will be split evenly, 55 with the immunotherapy alone, 55 with the immunotherapy plus cisplatin. Um, the dose is a billion uh, CFU or colony forming units of bacteria per dose for the immunotherapy. Um, that was the lowest of the three doses we uh, used in our phase one dose ranging study. In that study, we found that uh, the three dose levels of a billion, three billion, and ten billion uh, had roughly the same response rate. And so it seemed sensible to go for the lowest of the three uh, in the uh, actual study we have been conducting in India. Uh, the schedule is, uh, was determined basically by keeping a month between the doses and going to three means so that you have a basically a two-month dosing period. So, uh, so that's how we selected the dose and uh, the dosing schedule. Um. Very good. And just for everyone who is listening to the call, uh, not only will this audio file be made available on uh, One Med Place's website um, in, uh, very shortly, what we will also have on, on the same page would be the slide presentation that Advexis Pharmaceuticals' Dr. Rothman um, um, presented at the World Immunotherapy Conference. So as you listen to the audio file, you can look up the slides and things will become more meaningful. Um, uh, Tom, now as we proceed, in your press release you say that you obtain data in real time. There's real-time data collection. What does this mean? Well, uh, this is a survival study. Uh, and when we are measuring other things such as tumor burden reduction and the like, but because it's a survival study, in essence, the uh, results are transparent to the company because we can track the survival of these patients in basically real time. For instance, in preparation for this conference, we recontacted all the patients um, in the few days previous to the presentation to ensure, in fact, that they're, in fact, still alive and either well or reasonably well. Um, and so... Um, uh, we're in an unusual position where we can see the study develop as it goes, and that, in fact, was one reason why we uh, felt obliged to share these preliminary results uh, and, in fact, committed to do so publicly a year and a half ago because we can't afford to have the company know so much more about what's going on in the clinical trial than our investors do. Um, so we are in a position where uh, we know on a weekly basis we update the survival status of these patients, um, and so we pretty much know what's going on in real time. Okay. And when you say that as of today 88 patients are on the trial, 
of the total 110 targeted. Um, what does that mean? Have all state patients received all three doses of, of the agent, or have all three, all 88 patients received at least one dose, or are these just the tranche of patients who have finished informed consent are in the trial? Uh, these are the number of patients who have received at least one dose. At least one dose. Very good. Okay. Um, okay. And um, just a quick look at the side effect profile. Um, you know, most immunotherapy agents and yours too um, are generally benign flu-like conditions. Um, um, you give them you give them enough prophylactic treatment. Uh, but just if is can flu can the occurrence of flu-like symptoms be considered a surrogate marker that the drug is working? Um, if, if a patient were to not have the flu-like symptom at all, um, then would that, be, would that be a way to say that this patient is likely not to have any effects of the drug, be it early effects on, on tumor or late effects on survival? It's, that's an excellent question. Uh, it's one that, that's difficult to answer in a yes or no, black and white kind of fashion. The innate immune response, which is what we're seeing with these flu-like system, uh, symptoms, which comes from suddenly battling a billion uh, listeria being injected IV into you, is a clear sign that there's an immune system there that is active and capable of working. And so from that standpoint, it's clearly a sign that the patient is uh, has an opportunity to benefit from the treatment based on the strength of that immune response. On the other hand, we are, uh, unlike phase one, in this trial, we are pre-dosing patients with uh, NSAID, in fact, naproxen, as well as a, uh, as a compound designed to minimize the uh, nausea that some of these patients feel. And it's clear that those have proven to be very effective because only 39% of our patients have actually experienced any kind of adverse event at all, any kind of flu-like symptoms. And so uh, we know from our own research and from research done by other independent investigators, it doesn't appear that the administration of NSAIDs which does damp down the flu-like symptoms, interferes with the immune response. And uh, uh, and so we're pretty certain of that, and we've done some additional research on that recently. Uh, and so the answer to your question is, it's a good thing to have a flu-like response because that confirms your immune system is working, but it's not necessary to demonstrate that it's going to work because it's possible to uh, reduce those uh, uh, those reactions with this pre-administration of NSAIDs and um, antihistamines. Um, you said that 34% of all patients uh, uh, that received the drug had flu-like symptoms. Um, were many of these 34%, which is roughly maybe 29 or 30 patients, um, were many of these the same patients that had CRPRs or stable disease by resist criteria? Uh, we actually haven't done that cross analysis yet, okay. uh, and so um, I'll, I'll give you a call as soon as we do. It would be very interesting to see. Okay. Now, in one of these cases of flu, it was a grade three um, event, and I am curious uh, uh, what that means. Is that with febrile neutropenia, or what was the manifestation of the grade three event? Actually, it was not a flu-like symptom that got the grade three. It was a unexpected hypertensive event. And normally, we see hypotension with the administration of, of, of this immunotherapy because uh, the body temperature goes up and, and the, system, the uh, vascular system compensates for that. But instead, what we saw was a spike in blood pressure. Uh, which was transient and um, and over in less than a day, but that was an unexpected side effect which uh, we had never seen before. I got gotcha. you. Um, now I'm going to ask you probably the most important question of the hour. Um, uh, take your time to explain this to me and to my uh, and to uh, our our listeners very very carefully because this is the most important thing from the study. Um, you have reported that um, that your six-month survival is 
62%, 34 of 55 patients. Nine-month survival is 41%, 15 of 37 patients. And one-year survival is 40%, 6 of 15 patients. Can you walk us through very carefully where the numerator and the denominators come from? Um, um, since on both arms of the study, the agent is being given, so how exactly can we do the math to tease apart these um, these numbers. So this is probably the most important question for me. Um, and and this, uh, this is an important question indeed to talk about. Because this is a preliminary analysis, you don't have the luxury of knowing where all these patients are going to turn out. You only can kind of take a snapshot of where they are at the moment. Um, and so, uh, and because they entered the study at differing times over a 14-month period, um, it's not like a foot race where everyone starts on the same starting line and you just take a quick look at them and you can tell who's ahead and who's behind. Instead, you have to look at the data and what we were interested in is of the people who had been in the study for six months, by that I mean who'd started dosing, six months prior to January 25th, what percent of those people were still alive? And so the numerator in this case is the number that are still alive, and the denominator is the number of patients who enrolled in the study six months um, ago, six months or more ago. And, and so um, that's what that percentage represents, the number of people alive out of those who had a chance to be alive for six months. Similarly, at 270 days, you look at the data and say, how many patients enrolled in the study 270 days or more ago, and what percent of those patients um, are alive at day 270? And then finally, at 360, it's the same question. How many people enrolled 360 days or longer ago, and of those, what percent are alive at day 360? And so that's how each of those numbers gets derived. So further clarifying this point, uh, so the six-month number when it is, when you say the numerator is 34 and the denominator is 55, that would imply that, that at a given point in time, uh, there were 55 patients, the denominator, who had been on this trial at least six months, if not more. And of those, of those 55 patients who entered six months ago, 34 of them are still alive, i.e. 21 have died. Correct. So I have to clarify slightly, Melanie, that it's 34, um, if you will, were alive at six months. If, if there is a fatality after six months, then they're still in the six-month pod, but they'll never make it to the nine-month pod Correct. in, in terms of as a survivor. So all the women in the six-month tranche, um, all, the, all the women in the, sorry, let me say this differently. All the women in the 12-month tranche are also in the nine-month tranche, all the women in the nine-month tranche are also in the six-month tranche. Exactly. Very good. Okay. Got it. Uh, now, the numerator, then, you are saying, includes patients that got the drug but on either arm, so both drug alone and drug plus cisplatin. Correct. Okay. Now, can you – can you? Um, I don't know if you have this information offhand or not – can you break this down, the numerators in each of these three cases, six, nine, and 12 months, can you break the numerator down a little bit further on how many patients were alive on drug alone and how many patients were alive on drug plus platinum? I'm just trying to see, um, uh, just trying to get a, a, a quick ballpark for teasing out the effect of the drug. So, Melanie, that's a great question, and um, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, and we also felt like by, because these are very evenly divided between the two, you're in essence cutting all these numbers in half. And so as you get out, for instance, to 12 months, that's not a lot of, P, not a lot of N, a lot of number of patients in each. What I will say is 
yeah, the numbers are performing the way we kind of expected. That is, cisplatin is a potent uh, anti-tumor drug, and so it will pro it has it seems to have a, a modest effect in terms of, of delivering somewhat better survival results at six months, which is what you'd expect given all these women have cancer that is growing and in most cases has metastasized already when they enter the study. So hitting them with cisplatin is, is usually a good way to slow things down for a while. The problem is it doesn't work for forever by any means. Um, but we are, what we also see is that the survival rates between the two arms are closing over time. And so the immunotherapy alone, it, it keeps getting closer and closer to the immunotherapy plus cisplatin, and both at still pretty attractive levels. So um, this is something we'll be looking at very closely because the, the real design of the study is, is principally to determine what the impact of adding cisplatin is. Um, but at this point, I don't have the exact numbers for you, but I, hopefully I've given you a, a good general description. And as I say, it's what you'd expect in comparing an immunotherapy, which normally takes up to six months to take full effect, with cisplatin, which takes a matter of hours to begin having an effect. And, and, and we'll go into the is, issue of uh, um, tumor responses in just one minute. I have a couple of survival questions still. Um, so what was the median overall survival in this study? Well, we haven't determined the median as yet. What we know for sure is that with 62% uh, survival at six months, it's going to be significantly north of six months. Um, and uh, and so uh, that would compare well with the uh, experience of a, a set of trials that were done among single agents uh, under the aegis of the National Cancer Institute gyneco Gynecologic Oncology Group. Um, but at this point, we haven't determined the exact median survival, and uh, we'd like to load a few more patients in before we make that determination. Very good. Um, since you bring up the issue of the gynecologic oncology group, the GOG, uh, this is a perfect time to ask my next question. Uh, there is a slide on Dr. Rothman's presentation um, that talks about all the historic data. And you and I have spoken about this ad nauseum that the, uh, when we initiated coverage on you, that the benchmark in this disease, this disease is one year survival of 5% and um, and median overall survival of roughly six months. From looking at the slide that Dr. Rotman has, I can work back work back the math that gives median overall survival of six months. I can do that very easily. But my question is, there is one phase three study, more at all from 2004, where the median overall survival was an outlier at 8.8 .8 months. What was different about this study, and what can we glean about this as we think about um, um, the Advaxis drug and future trials? So if I would, Melanie, I'd like to talk very briefly about the slide he has, which is called Cervical Cancer Treatment Failures, GOG 127 series, only to help folks understand that this was a part of a broad set of studies that the GOG ran trying to find something that would be effective against uh, recurrent metastatic uh, cervical cancer. And um, on this, on John's chart, um, there are six studies that are summarized. And what we did to pick a benchmark for our therapy was to pick um, uh, the, the protocol 127 study, which is marked in this chart as C, which was actually a combination of cisplatin and pentoxifilin, if I said that right. It was the biggest of the studies in this group with 45 patients, and there the median survival was 6.2 months. All the other studies delivered uh, much lower survival, and it's also where the 5% landmark survival of 12 months is derived. So we kind of picked the best of this uh, group of phase two studies conducted by uh, the gynecologic oncology group in the U.S. as kind of our standard. The um, since that group of studies, there was a phase three study done, which you're referring to, Melanie, uh, um, which, was, which was a phase three study, which means it's a far more finished product. 
and it uses a uh, technology called platinum doublets uh, to provide a very high dose of cisplatin to the patients, and it showed a higher survival rate than our benchmark, and that's great. The better for the patients, the better it is. Um, but it's an example of taking all these earlier technologies and based on the learning in these phase two studies, creating a tuned um, and uh, exquisitely dosed combination to get somewhat better results utilizing uh, this uh, still rather venerable chemotherapy uh, technology. So we look at that as um, as something that we show because we're, we're going to show all the data we can, but our, uh, it also is uh, in our phase three, we would look to have uh, potentially a combination and a dosing regimen based on our phase two learnings, which would also maximize success. So we view the right comparator be the best of the phase two studies, and then when we go out and do our phase three, the right comparator will be the best of the phase three studies. Got it. Very good. Um, uh, Tom, now let's look at the tumor responses for a few minutes. Uh, you have spoken about three complete responses with complete tumor uh, abrogation, and you have spoken about four partial responses with uh, significant greater than 30% uh, tumor reduction, and you have a slide on it. Um, um, my question to you is, historically, immunotherapies are not uh, thought to work through early effects on tumor abrogation. You have showed it previously in your phase one study um, and, and now again in your phase two study. Why do you think that um, ADXS HPV is uh, somewhat unconventional in that it is showing a tumor response? Uh, furthermore, you have not given us any uh, data. Uh, you know, more, you've been very humble and not given us any data on, on uh, the stable diseases. And we know quite well that with immunotherapy, stable diseases also matter because they w might have late effects on survival. So what are the stable disease numbers from this study? Um, well, I, to do that, I probably would, it's best to look at the so-called waterfall plot which uh, Dr. Rothman uh, also has in this slide deck which will be on your site. And if you look at that, that would show, um, that would suggest that over half of the patients are in, um, probably significantly more than half the patients are in a stable disease state. We, for the purposes of this early analysis, have focused on this unexpected and encouraging incidence of, of uh, better than 30% tumor response, and also on the fact that when you look at how the tumors have gone away, while a couple have gone away immediately, what we see uh, in the partial responses in particular is progressive reduction in tumor burden at three-month intervals, which is a classic sign or even better than the classic sign of immunotherapy effectiveness. And that's what we would love to see for all these patients over time. And over time, we'll see how many actually achieve this. Uh, one of the interesting things about reporting the study as it goes is, in theory, if the compound of fact is effective, each report should get better. Uh, very well. Okay. And, um, Tom, now just... just uh, rearing away from the clinical trial itself to the business of running a company because um, um, science can only be performed when it's well, well, good science can only be performed when it's well funded. Um, as you release these interim analysis results, it comes at a very nice time for the biotech industry, um, um, you know, particularly small cap, mid cap biotech, cell gene acquiring uh, uh, Avila Pharmaceuticals for their BTK inhibitor and Amgen acquiring Micromet for their uh, BITE inhibitor for um, 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 hematologic cancers. What has been the interest if, if um, uh, ADXS HPV is to go into phase three trials um, and, and, and you are um, proceeding forward with everything that we've spoken about, what has been the interest in uh, partnering with yourself and, um, and uh, what are the things that you want to do going forward from a commercialization and partnering point of view? Um, and, should, and, and, you know, 
some deals take longer to be struck. Sometimes the best deals take, take longer to be struck. Would you be amenable to going into a phase three study? Would you be financially amenable to going into a phase three study um, without uh, such a signed partner on? Well, um, excellent question. Um, number one, it is our strategy as a company because this platform can yield so many different constructs targeting so many different cancers and infectious diseases. It's our core strategy as a company to develop each contract to the proof of concept point and then license it out. The HPV uh, uh, cancer, uh, HPV caused cancer market is one of the largest out there. In fact, HPV probably counts for about 7% of all cancers. Uh, and in the U.S., if you uh, if you look at the uh, diagnosis of SIN, the early uh, cervical dysplasia associated with cervical cancer, that market is bigger than the prostate and breast cancer combined. So we've started out in um, the biggest possible market, um, and uh, and our goal will be to demonstrate proof of concept both in cervical cancer and in cervical dysplasia in a separate study. Uh, but if the licensing process were to go slowly, which I don't think it would, uh, but if it did, uh, we're capable, um, uh, we plan to be capable of doing a phase three study so the development of the technology isn't hindered by the, uh, the always slower than expected uh, mechanism of negotiating a deal. Very good. And um, to keep this conversation today brief and, uh, you know, to the point, I uh, want to wrap up now, but just one last question, because both the earlier SIN indication, the cervical dysplasia indication, and um, the recurrent cervical cancer uh, indication together form the continuum of the disease, and you're running two separate trials. Today we saw results from the recurrent disease trial, and the SIN trial is still in the works. Can you tell us when can we see some uh, numbers, some results out of the SIN trial so that it starts making more sense as, uh, as a whole? Well, it won't be that long a wait. The SIN trial we're conducting in the U.S. is 120 patients. It's single-blind, placebo-controlled, and there are three different doses. And we, we have explored the lower range of doses because for women who don't have cancer and have, quote, just, and quote, cervical dysplasia, the tolerance of adverse events is going to be much lower. So we went extraordinarily low in the first low dose, uh, basically one twentieth of the dose we're using in India. Uh, and then the mid dose is one third, and then the high dose is equal to the dose we're using in India. The low dose uh, uh, segment of 40 patients, it's actually 41, um, has been completed in terms of dosing, and we're almost complete in terms of the diagnostic assessment after six months of how effectively our uh, immunotherapy is performed versus placebo. We're about, uh, about two-thirds of the way through the recruitment of the mid-dose group, and we hope to have that recruitment complete by the end of February, and those results will be coming out in the August-September time period. And then the high dose group should complete recruitment in the July August time frame, and those results will come out early in 2013. So there's a lot of news flow coming in for us as we'll be updating these cervical cancer results, and we'll start uh, dealing out thin data by late February. Very good. And um, on this uh, on this note, I would like to take your leave. Thank you so much for this very interesting conference call. I hope our listeners um, um, uh, benefit from it, and um, um, I would also want to bring to the attention of all our listeners today that uh, OneMed Research initiated on Avexis Pharmaceuticals in December 2011. Please, please read our uh, succinct two-page initiation that discusses the, and all the issues at hand. It talks about the cervical cancer marketplace, both the SIN indication and the recurrent metastatic indication, how many patients are addressable, and it discusses both the trials to some detail. Um, uh, Tom, thank you so much for your time. Um, once again, uh, everybody, this is Tom Moore, the CEO of Vexus Pharmaceuticals, ticker ADXS on the uh, bulletin board with interim analysis of the phase two recurrent cervical cancer India trial. 
um, uh, signing off from New York. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Tom.